Hi, I'm Rod Dreer. I'm here on Blogging Heads TV today with Colin Murphy. I, before we get to Colin, I just want to say that I am a writer at the Dallas Morning News, the author of Crunchy Cons, and a blogger on BeliefNet.com. Colin, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Well, it's great to uh, join you too, Rod. Well, I, I've got to tell you, I'm a big fan of your book. I, I picked it up this summer before I made a trip of all places to Istanbul. And uh, if you're going to think about the decline of civilization, you know, there's no better place, I think, to go if you're not going to go to the ruins in Rome than to Istanbul, which uh, was once, as you know, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and is no more. But uh, it's a good place to be because and I, I was reading your book on the plane over there, and I was telling everybody I, I met at the conference I was at about the book, uh, because we really are in what I think a lot of people realize is a transitional era. It doesn't mean we're necessarily in decline, but we are definitely, we're, we're changing. Things are changing. And it, I bet that's why you, you wrote that book. Well, that's, that's right. And uh, it's interesting that you bring up the example of, of Istanbul, because, of course, you were no doubt walking through the great, uh, what is now a mosque of Hagia Sophia, and was, yeah. was built as a, as a Christian basilica dedicated on Christmas Day 525 uh, by, by Justinian. And uh, that was, when, when the dome of that building was, was constructed, it was the last dome of that size until, I believe, the Duomo of Florence, uh, which shows you what has happened to building skills in the intervening 900 years. So it's an indication, indication of what can happen when a, when a civilization uh, begins to take a, uh, a, a downward uh, trajectory. Uh, but I was, in, in Are We Rome, I was, I was interested in the age-old comparison, really, of, of civilizations, and in our case, between ancient Rome and, and modern America, because a number, of, a number of parallels really did to, seem to me to stand out, even though clearly there are vast differences between, between the two societies. Well, you know, it's interesting. When I, I went into the Hagia Sophia, which was a mosque, and now it's a, a state museum. After the, the Republic was declared, they apparently decided it's not going to be any religious building. But you still have uh, Christian and Muslim, uh, what would be the word, not paraphernalia, but you, signs there, and you still have some of the old mosaics. And I went in through the door that had been reserved for the emperor back in the Byzantine days, and there above the door is a mosaic of Christ with these very stern eyes looking down at you. And you know, I had to stop for a second and realize what those eyes have seen over the years, the coming and going of empire. Well, and, uh, go ahead. Uh, that, well, that, that's right. And, um, but the other thing you see is that uh, society doesn't stop. You know, if you're up on the railings on the second floor and you look at the carvings, that you know, the graffiti that's been left there uh, over the the centuries by people coming and going, and you see that there are Viking runes carved in the marble balustrades. So, you know, somehow, you know, commerce will always out, no matter no matter what happens. Yeah, life doesn't end just because the empire does. You know, I'd like to begin our conversation today, Cullen, with a quote from George Orwell, in which he described a wasp that was sucking jam on my plate, and I cut him in half. He paid no attention, merely went on with his meal, while a tiny stream of jam trickled out of his severed esophagus. Only when he tried to fly away did he grasp the dreadful thing that had happened to him, said Orwell. And that strikes me as a really good metaphor for our civilization right now. Uh, there were two events that made me start thinking about are we Rome and these, these times of civilizational decline, uh, events that I, I witnessed myself or had a personal emotional connection to in, our, in this decade. The first was September 11th. I, I was a New Yorker on that day. I worked for the New York Post then. I saw the South Tower fall from the Brooklyn Bridge, where I was standing. And uh, I think any of us who lived through that day, whether you lived through it in New York or Washington or anywhere in the country, you felt the, the deep trauma and the shock of how quickly things can end. The, the, second, uh, the, the second event was Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I live in Dallas, so I didn't have to live through that. But I'm from South Louisiana. My family lived down there, although not in New Orleans. But that whole week, I was just, uh, I felt it so intensely. And I, I even had to go home from work one day because I, the city, New Orleans, that I'd been to many times before and loved, suddenly it all seemed to be falling apart. And I think both of those events, which of course happened in this decade, 
reminded a lot of us about how very fragile civilization is and how the, the, the things we take for granted, we, we're really very foolish to do that. Uh, did, did those events at all inspire your, your interest in this topic? Well, not specifically, but the, the, the great quotation from Orwell that you've just mentioned really does capture the kind of um, uh, state of mind that I've, I've sometimes been in. It's the most natural question in the world, just to follow that, that wasp metaphor. Um, at what stage in the wasp's life are we as a civilization? You know, have, we, have we already been cut in half and we just don't know it? We'll know it when we decide to, to fly away? Are we at some point uh, prior to that? Are we still in the larval stage? And of course, when you, when you have the example of, of Rome in front of you, uh, you have this, this enormous span of time from which to pick you know, possible parallels, you know, okay, does it, you know, if there's a comparison that works between these two places, what is the comparison? Which two points in society are you, are you comparing? Is it Republican Rome versus, um, you know, modern America? Is it the Rome at the height of empire and so on? Uh, and the other thing about the, uh, the, the wasp example that really uh, seems like it strikes home to me is the sense of not knowing. Uh, in your own lifetime, you actually may not know what the, what the situation is for your particular society. It may be you know, two or three hundred years before people can look back and say, oh yeah, we now know that they were on the point of you know, fill in the blank. And uh, you know, just looking at the, the example of the fall of Rome itself, this, you know, this epical moment that we assign the date 476 to, how many people in the Roman Empire actually knew that the empire had fallen at that moment? Right. Uh, you know, you, if you went to um, you know, to peasants in the fields, um, if you took a if, if Gallup had existed at that time and had done a survey, uh, probably most people wouldn't have a clue that the empire had had fallen because, you know, in many ways, life was was unchanged. It only became clear later on. It's such an interesting problem trying to get that kind of thousand year perspective on your own on your own society, which is one of the things that that uh, looking at a place like Rome helps you do, I think. Well there's a great Auden poem uh, about uh, the, the, the youth that falls out of the sky and uh, the, the, the ship has to sail on and uh, even these great events that the, the fall of empires but as you pointed out at the beginning of the conversation, daily life goes on. The people don't disappear just because the empire made. That's that's right, and that's, and that's one of the uh, the issues when, I, when I'm thinking about modern America. Just the, the dailiness of life. How durable is the dailiness of life? When just thinking back to the uh, to the fall of Rome, uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, Ray, by. Um, uh, Peter Brown called The World of Late Antiquity, in which he talks about the, the, the great continuity between the end of Rome and the beginning of what came next, and that in many parts of the world, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to detect a decline. And part of the reason is because certain ordinary things continue. And when I look at modern America and I think about some of the things that worry me most, places where I think we have real problems, at the same time, I wonder about just the, the the durable dailiness of life. How much of that, how much of that will will continue? Um, I mean, I know that you think about some of these things, too, uh, especially this idea of you know the continuity of community. I mean, what is what is what is your sense, just looking at modern America, about the 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 durability of, of core institutions? Like, I mean, this you know, is one thing, you're, you're right, that really does concern me. And uh, I, I have more questions than answers, I'm afraid. I, I, I've been reading recently, uh, Alan Ehrenholt, he wrote a book in the mid-'90s, he's the editor of Governing Magazine, he wrote a book called The Lost City about Chicago in the 1950s and how it was uh, a city of neighborhoods, of stable neighborhoods that uh, people could really count on. But And it all went away in the 1960s. Well, it went away because... Uh, for better or for worse, we had a cultural revolution in the country where people became more interested in individual freedom, individual rights, because they were reacting in many ways to some uh, to oppression in the 50s, racial oppression, gender oppression, that sort of thing. But the, the point Aaron Hall, make, Aaron Hall makes in his book is that 
we we want to have the 50s back, that the sort of stable, orderly 50s, the neighborly 50s, but we don't want the bad stuff, the oppression with it. And he says it doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. You can't edit these things out. That the only way you're going to be able to have these sort of stable, safe communities uh, where you have a whole lot of civic trust is if there is an overriding social authority. And we just don't have that anymore. And I was thinking, reading this about my own life, I come from a small town in rural South Louisiana, couldn't wait to get out of there. I mean, it was a very safe place to grow up, and I, I think back at the, uh, the halcyon time I had as a, as a child out there in the country, uh, safe to play anywhere, but I couldn't wait to get out of there as a teenager. And because we live in the society we do, I was able to you know, get educated, I was able to go as far around the world as my dreams would take me. And, I realized recently that uh, since I left home at 16 for boarding school, I've, the most I've lived in one single address has been four years, and I think that's living here in Dallas. Uh, and I love that. That's great. I had opportunities my mom and dad never had. But at the same time, I can't let my kids go out my front door and go to the playground around the corner from my house without adult supervision because all the, the social trust that uh, was taken for granted by, uh, by even my parents' generation, all that has evaporated because in large part of the social mobility and the individual freedoms that we have. So uh, I, I think a lot about wanting to live in a, in a more stable community, uh, but I, I don't know how we can put it back together absent that social authority that, uh, that we threw out in the, in the 50s. And in some cases it was good that it went. Don't, I'm not being nostalgic for the 50s. But uh, I, I, this is the, uh, one of the central political problems of our era, and I don't see uh, any easy solution. Yeah, um, in a sense, we're, we're talking about two parallel things. One of them has to do with civil society and whether whether the, inst the institutions of civil society are are healthy and thick on the ground, um, and and then the other has to do with just the overarching institutions of of government. Uh, mostly in my book, I'm not talking about civil society, although it's a it's it's a very important subject, and you can argue that it's the institutions of civil society that really tied it, you know, European culture over uh, from the fall of Rome to uh, to the Middle Ages, and notably, well, and you know, notably the church. If I could stop you just for a second, it was Edmund Burke who said that we learn to love the little platoons in society. That's where we first, in a, in a democracy, we first get our civic consciousness. And the things you write about in your book, about the, the great institutions of government that people are losing faith in, I think it, it starts at home. Well, yes, yeah, certainly. The, the, the great institutions that, that I'm concentrating on in my book, um, one of them is, of course, the military. And you can argue that in, in many ways the, the American military is a very healthy institution. It certainly is uh, racially and ethnically uh, you know, more, uh, more, more diverse and, than uh, many other institutions. And um, uh, at the same time, that is being compromised in many different ways, both by the, uh, uh, the strain we're putting it under uh, and also by... Um, Related to that manpower issues, the other uh, the other big topic I bring up is just the nature of government itself. The fact that we are we are allowing functions of government that we've been taking for granted and in many ways rely on um, to leach out of public hands into into private hands. Just looking at the newspaper this morning about uh, Blackwater in Iraq brings both of these topics um, you know, right into our laps where you have a, um, you know, a contractor that is, you know, there's a question of who even has authority over this, this, um, uh, this company in Iraq when, uh, when questions arise over its conduct. You know, is it the Iraqi government? Is it the American government? And yet, um, uh, yet here it is, in some sense, being a tool of American, American policy. Th this, uh, this feeling of, of you know, the public good, the public welfare, and um, uh, public objectives no longer really being in public hands is is to me a very worrisome one, and and you see something very parallel happening in in Rome, where you know, over time every government job is something that is bought and sold, every government um, function becomes something that you that you pay for 
uh, every person is really out for himself or, or herself. Uh, that, that sense, that old sense of Republican virtue, uh, and you know, res publica really you know, means the public thing, uh, virtually disappears, and it's a kind of it's a kind of slow crisis. Uh, it's hard to notice how serious it, it becomes in, in a in a single lifetime, uh, but over a couple of centuries, I think it's just it's, it's perhaps the most corrosive thing that is happening to us now. You know, along those lines, I, one thing I've noticed about American political life is. But when I was researching my book, Crunchy Cons, I, I went back and read Jimmy Carter's famous Malaise speech. And I, I where he, remember, where I he never like, uses the word Malaise. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but uh, I, I reread the speech because I, I was a child uh, during Carter's presidency. I was born in 1967. And uh, I, I had this memory from childhood of Carter as being this horrible president. And uh, thank God we had Reagan, and he came and he saved the country. And that was my memory as a child. But I read the Malay's speech as a conservative, uh, a traditional conservative, uh, 39 years old. And uh, I was amazed at, at how conservative that speech was. It was all about self-reliance and, and conservation and, and, and limit yourself. And it was very and a very ascetic speech. And I thought, my God, how, how is it that we conservatives demonized this man <laughs> for, for what he had to say? But uh, in that speech, though, it went over like a lead balloon, as we all know. And I think that it would be very hard for any politician, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, to make that sort of appeal to the American electorate today to conserve, to cut back, to sacrifice for the common good. Uh, we, we hear all the time, I, I'm here on an editorial page, and we're always hearing people complaining about Washington spending all this money. But guess what? How, like, how many politicians of either party could come in and say, you know what, we have to do more with less for the greater good. I don't think that person could get elected in the office, and that is a corruption of the people. It's not our politicians. Our politicians give us what we want. Yeah, I was, I was thinking just the other day, I was trying to look at the, um, the five-year period between uh, um, the, the beginning of the Iraq war, or the run-up to the Iraq war, and, and right now, and, and, and contrasting that with the five-year period uh, that ends in 1945, when America mobilized for World War II, and just the the, the enormous amount of, of of mobilization and sacrifice that occurred in the 40 to 45 year period, when you think about of the amount of of harnessing of economic uh, power that occurred during that time, the huge deflection of national will that occurred, the enormous social changes, um, uh, women in the workforce, uh, the the real. Uh, Stirrings once again of, of, of civil rights, um, the industrialization of the, of, the, of the West Coast. When you think of all of the things that occurred during that five-year period, and now you look at the five-year period that has ended, um, or that is encompassed by the, uh, the five years of the Iraq War, and you're struck by just the poverty of of the modern of the modern response. Um, and you know, and part of that is is um, you know, I think a failure of, of, of the executive in this case to um, um, you know, to get us to get us going. But speaking of the executive, one of one of the things that I that I bring up in the book has to do with executive power, and mm -hmm. as opposed to you know legislative or or senatorial power in the case of in the case of Rome, where over time you just you see in Rome's case that the the sheer um, uh, volume of the of the foreign affairs task, uh, the, the the burden of managing empire becomes so great that power almost inevitably be, becomes more and more concentrated in in the hands of, of one person, or at least arguments are made that it, it had better be. And to my mind, we, we see an awful lot of that right now. Um, and I wonder whether whether there's really any reversing it, whether um, whether Congress, as an institution, actually has already reached the point of no return, uh, and you know, can ever assert its power again. That is, that is my fear for uh, for the next four years. I think we will have a Democratic president. And as a Republican, I I think that we deserve that. Um, we I, I could not vote for a Republican again after Iraq, at least not right now. Nevertheless, the thing that concerns me about the Democrats, especially Hillary Clinton is that she, she and they look at, at Bush and think that, well, we can do what he did. We'll just be smarter about it. 
and the, the, the temptation to take the ring of power, to use uh, Tolkien's metaphor, I think it is enormous. And if, God forbid, we should have another 9-11 attack, style attack, I, I, I think that uh, I mean, we all remember what it was like to be so afraid. I, I remember it at the time. I, Bush could have asked for anything, and I, I think, I know I was so traumatized, I would have given it to him. And in fact, I, I was at National Review in those days, and I remember anything Bush said, I believe, because of the fear. Because I, I was sitting in my office in the afternoon wondering, okay, the dirty bomb goes off in Times Square. How am I going to get back home to Brooklyn? You know, these crazy thoughts that you, it would happen every single day. And that's how liberty gets given away. I can see that now in retrospect. didn't see it then. And I, I think that uh, if we have another crisis like that in this country, whoever's the president, Republican or Democrat, there will be that great temptation on the part of the people who may not have learned a thing from the past few years. Well, let me ask you a question. I, d I don't know the answer, but it's just um, uh, someone surely has studied this. You know, when I, uh, you were talking about giving away liberty. When, I, when you look at Rome, liberty was given away over time. There was... It, it just it seems an inexorable process. And nowadays, um, we certainly are giving up certain amounts of liberty in a trade-off that we think is a fair trade-off for security. At least that's the argument that's, that's being made. I'm just wondering, um, what are the examples of moments when liberty is given back? Uh, I mean, there, there are cataclysmic moments when liberty is taken again by a people. You know, revolutionary moments, uh, although often those don't work out so well. Uh, but are there uh, are there significant incremental examples of when um, you know the state of emergency is you know is conclusively ended and people turn back the clock and say you know all of the measures that we put into place we no longer need and we're going to go back to the status quo ante and and so on. So, and, and, you can almost think of it as kind of a Cincinnati moment in, in terms of individual rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there must be, but I, uh, I can't think of them. Do, do no, any, any come to mind? No, nothing comes to mind. You know, one thing that your question does bring to my mind is how much uh, sovereignty and Republican virtue we Americans today hand over for the sake of comfort and convenience. I, uh, I, I'm really interested in how consumerism uh, Consumerism is eroding Republican virtue in this country. Uh, I think right here in North Texas, where I am, we, immigration is an enormous issue because there's so many migrants, legal and illegal, here in Texas. And uh, we have suburban voters who are very angry about this. They feel like they're losing control of the borders or losing control of the country uh, because all these migrants are here and we can't seem to do anything about it. It is a legitimate concern. On the other hand, I, you know, I want to say to them, you know, you depend on cheap consumer goods. You, cheap consumer goods depends on the labor of these illegal migrants. You know, if you want to get cheap chicken at the grocery store, you get that cheap chicken because the chicken processing plant is hiring uh, migrants that it can pay for. Uh, pay, you know, wouldn't have to pay what they have to pay Americans. And so I, I think that there is a uh, something that Americans aren't really aware of. It's certainly on, on the political right. We like to talk about price, 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 and the economy, the economy, the economy. But at the same time, we like to complain about all these migrants coming in. As you point out in your book, the, the barbarian invasion of, of Rome was not that at all. There was a lot of, of ebb and flow of population, and the, the Romans welcomed them in many ways. But after a while, it really did change the culture. And I, I think I, I'll close on this. I, I was at a, a school recently in, in a poor part of Dallas, and uh, I was there with some donors. It was a private school. And uh, a young boy, a Hispanic boy, was asked to stand up. He was a fourth grader, asked to stand up and, and uh, to say for the visitors who his favorite figure of history is. And uh, the teacher clearly, clearly didn't know what he was going to say. He said, Santa Ana for his great deed at the Alamo. Well, you could hear a gasp in the older Texans there because you know, he was the great villain of the Alamo. Sure. But, uh, but I thought when I heard that little boy say that, I thought, there is a shift. There is the culture of, of Texas taking a turn, and in, in turn, uh, the, the culture of the United States. And it struck me when I heard that, I was reminded of your book and of the part. I don't mean to say these immigrants are barbarians, but you know what I'm saying, that there, there is a different tribe moving in and establishing its own values, and it's being welcomed here by economic change. 
Well, that's right, but uh, I mean, this isn't the first time. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sure uh, Thomas Jefferson would be uh, a little surprised if, if some other kid said that his hero was Martin Luther King. I'm, the uh, the country has changed in enormous ways, and in fact, when when you when you really think about it, America is so much more different right now than it was in 1776 than than Rome was when it fell from Rome when it began. It, the, uh, the the amount of sameness in terms of ordinary people's lives in ancient Rome from beginning to end was considerable. Uh, in America, the uh, I mean, there may be certain uh, strands of sameness in terms of mentality, perhaps, in some of our governing institutions. But when you look at the country as a, the fabric of the country, it it has it's been kind of turned over by a plow every every 50 years in uh, in enormous ways uh, by immigration, but not just by immigration, but by Economic change, you know, technological transformation, and um, and so on. Um, and maybe that is what our sameness uh, is. Um, but, uh, Rod, I, w I want, wanted to get back to a point that you were uh, bringing up just a second ago, though, about Republican ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it actually it really goes back to also to what you were saying about what uh, you know, what happens when a civilization falls or declines how do you know it's happening um, what you know, what are the what are the benchmarks what kinds of things do you lose and um, uh, you know in thinking about what things we would lose first if if we went into some sort of real decline as a as a society you know, the first thoughts usually run to things like technology and and such but I, I wonder at this point if actually the first thing we would lose would be self-government, whether that's that's the uh, the, the most vulnerable uh, you know, cultural uh, trope at this point. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. But let's say you you suddenly took away a lot of the apparatus of democracy that we currently have, um, the media, you know, the political parties. And uh, the, the technology that's holding the country together, and and as a kind of experiment, and then just watched what happened afterwards. Do you, do you think kind of American self-government would grow back, or do you think people have kind of let those skills atrophy? I think they've let the skills atrophy. I uh, I was thinking about how, you know, in just a span of one generation the skills that have been lost in, in my own life. My father grew up in, in rural Louisiana. He was college educated, but because he grew up in the Depression, they had to learn how to plant. They had to learn how to hunt. They had to learn how to fix everything themselves, and he did. And most of the men of his generation did where I'm from. I'm his son. I don't know how to do any of those things. I'm, I'm highly trained in, in, in what I can do in journalism and writing, things like that. But if we had a crisis, if... Uh, say the avian flu wiped out a third of the population or there was some sort of uh, you know, terrorist attack that we can't even imagine that, that plunged us into a civilizational crisis, people like me would be helpless. And more and more people are moving into the do, cities. Do you keep a manual typewriter at home? No. No. No, if we lost power, I mean, I, I, I'm, I have a laptop. What am I supposed to do? And uh, I, I think that uh, you know, Jane Jacobs said that the the characteristic of a dark age is forgetfulness. And I think we have forgotten so many of the habits of, of self-government that you bring up, as well as just everyday things like taking, like providing for ourselves in terms of food and, and, uh, and heat and fuel, because we haven't had to, to know these things. And I, I really am concerned that these things will fall away. I, I remember when Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita both hit within three weeks of each other in South Louisiana. Katrina hit New Orleans, which was in, in chaos, because I think in many ways civil society had fallen apart there. But then Rita hit the Cajun area over by Lake Charles in the, the western part of the state. Now, the Cajun areas, it's more rural, small town, but the Cajuns have a very tight civil society. They still do maintain it. And I, I was down in Louisiana when that hurricane hit, and it was astonishing to tune into the television stations in Lafayette, Louisiana, and hear the, the anchormen speaking in Cajun French and in English, asking people to come on out, bring your bass boat out, and go, go rescue your neighbors. 
those were two cases where civil society failed in one case and held together in another. I'm afraid that that the New Orleans example is probably the the one that's more likely to be the American example. And the first thing that will go, I think you're right, is self-government because people won't know how to do anything for themselves and will be willing to accept anything that Washington says just for the sake of, of, of keeping it together. Yeah, and will it just be Washington or will it be the replacements for Washington? Um, you know, this is a, a question that I have for you since you are you are more to the right than, than I am. And there's a, there's a development that I write about in, in the book I've alluded to it al- already, where I could see you, I could see you going either either way, and that has to do with with privatization. You know, if if we're going to allow, if you don't want big government, and yet there are certain functions that have to be taken care of, uh, so the, the natural temptation is to invite the private sector in to do them, whether it's your highways or prisons or. Um, you know, doing security chores in Iraq or or whatever, and um, you know I wonder what you think about that. I, t- to me, it's corrosive if this goes too far, if this becomes the standard operating procedure. But that's that's the way it seems to be going at this point, and um, and and in many ways it went that way in in Rome as well. Yeah, that's a great you must be conflicted on this one. Yeah, I'm conflicted as well. I'm the sort of conservative who has an equal suspicion of big government and big business. But uh, I think about uh, my own city, for example, and I think Dallas, which I think is probably true for a lot of cities. Um, the middle class has largely left the city. I happen to live inside the city in a gentrified neighborhood. But uh, we wouldn't put our kids in the public schools here because they are uh, just a cesspool of patronage. And, uh, and low test scores and every everything you can imagine with an urban school system. The city government uh, doesn't really work that well, and people don't have much faith in it because it doesn't give you reason to have faith in it. And the thing that concerns me, as somebody who worries about civil society, is I don't want to live in a city where the government doesn't work. I think it's important that the government works, but at the same time, it's, it's awfully hard when you pick up the paper every day and read about this corruption, that corruption uh, investigation in this, this or that public public institution, and you just put your head on the table and like, is this ever going to get any better? I mean, I, I think that we have, uh, I find it difficult to see a, a sense of real public service in a lot of public servants right now. They seem to be on, on the gravy train. And I know that's a broad generalization, but uh, I... I, see, I look at private industry, I see corruption. I look at public uh, govern, public institutions and see corruption. And you just want to, at some point, just check out. Well, and I know I know you have some ideas about where to check out, too, or at least you've been thinking about um, about that topic. Let me ask you about that in just one second, but as a as a kind of segue, um, someone in one of the one of the reviews of of uh, Are We Rome called my stance that that of a moderate declinist, which I guess is kind of right. I'm not I'm not ready to throw in the towel about about our society or about America as an ideal. Far far from it. The the things that really do uh, have me troubled are things like the enormous pressure we put the military under and the and the too many tasks that we've thrown its way and than the one topic we've just been talking about, the privatization of, of government. And then a third, a third topic is, is just the kind of imperial arrogance we have, uh, even if it's not coupled with a, a true imperial impulse, but just the notion that we can do anything that we want in the world is, is, uh, is very damaging to, to really doing anything uh, in the world. Agreed. Um, and, uh, and another one is just regarding yourself as the, as the center of uh, of everything, but for all that, I mean, and these are serious things that that can just lead us down the road very slowly, but kind of, uh, you know, past the point of, of return. But but for all that, I I am basically optimistic, partly because of of reasons of the American character, and partly because not all institutions are unhealthy. Now, uh, looking at if you just if you look at the, the standard surveys that are published all the time of, of uh, what Americans think of this or that institution, I mean, it's easy to see that most institutions are held in some sort of uh, ill regard. 
and many of them are just, are objectively in terrible shape, like like the schools and so mm-hmm. on. Um, but some of them are not. Some of them are as healthy as they've ever <clears throat> ever been, and and some of them I think are actually taking new steps to become more relevant than ever before. And I'll give you one example that you may not agree with at all, but I think is actually real, and that is higher education, universities, colleges. Uh, by most measures, uh, and certainly compared with a lot of other institutions, they're doing well. Um, you know, economically more or less stable. They are still regarded as a beacon by almost everyone in America. Everybody wants a college education, uh, at least and every immigrant family wants their kids to, to have one. And this is still regarded as a supreme social good. And the people in more and more colleges and universities are, I think, stepping up to the fact that um, there's, they have to play more of a role in society, that there's a burden to be picked up because others are dropping it. Now, am I being, am I being Pollyanna here? Well, you know, I, I'm the Cassandra. I'm such a pessimist about things, as a, naturally, but uh, I... I want to believe you, and I, 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 I want to resist the sort of natural... You just have to click your heels, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> I want to resist the natural pessimism I have, because um, at this point, I'm, I have small children. I'm looking at, at the, the elementary and secondary schools, and it's pretty pretty dreadful. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll grant you that higher education is is improving. I have, good, I have high hopes for my kids to go to college, and I, I think that if we were a good society, we'd make it easier for more kids to go to college. But uh, I, I look at the, when I look at the public schools, that really concerns me because I'm a product of public school myself. And I remember when I was in school, there was, the school still had a certain amount of social authority. I keep coming back to that point. Well, nowadays, I, I have my, my sister teaches in public school. I have friends who teach in public school. And they say the, the hardest thing for them to deal with is the collapse of social authority. And Parents, uh, many of them immigrant parents, who are w- either working too hard or simply have different values about education and authority and, and discipline. And these teachers are having a hell of a time trying to educate the kids in, in this sort of environment. And uh, and I see people like me. I have my kid, my, I have one school age kid. We're either going to homeschool or we have him in private school now. We might homeschool our other kids, uh, not because we want to keep them away from, from, from taint. But uh, we, we, we just want them to learn. We don't want them to have to put up with the, the regime of constant testing and you know, there's no character education, that sort of thing. And I'm not going to make my kid a, an experiment just for the sake of, of, of standing up to public schools. On the other hand, I see where this ends. I see people like me and middle class people like me and upper middle class people retreating out of the public square because uh, there's no because it's chaotic there and dangerous and I wonder about where do we leave the the immigrant parents and the poor who do want to do better for their kids do we leave them in bad public schools I, I think that we just go round and round about this topic in our society we never do come to a resolution and, I, and I, it does something that really worries me well here's here's one um, uh, you know institution that doesn't really exist yet but but could become a new public square. You know, when you, th- when you think about Rome, one of the ironies is that uh, um, they left the ruins of public squares all over the map, and um, and yet, you know, partly the the uh, you know the reason for the decline was just the the end of this notion of, of what the what the public really is, which is what we're going through too, as you as you as you just said. Um, so, what about national service? As as something that we ought to be doing, you know, as a and as a response to some of the the kinds of ills we're talking about. When you look back at Rome, there there is a phenomenon that occurs that is seems to me uh, markedly parallel to what um, what is going on here, and that is the, the separation of society into you know, mutually unintelligible spheres. And specifically between the civilian and military, whereby by the you know, what had at one point been a basically a civilian army, uh, everybody obliged to, to serve. By the time that the empire is in its first century, you know that's gone. There's a situation that's much more like our our own society, where you have an elite caste of people, you know, the chattering classes, 
um, the rich, the, you know, the millionaires club, um, who really don't have any military obligations at all. You know, on, the Ro on the Italian peninsula, most Romans are not doing military service by the end of the, of the first century. And then you have the creation of a kind of caste drawn from the provinces and then ultimately from the outsiders, uh, who are the military um, uh, populace. You have two societies there, and really not much connection between them, and um, you know, a lot of suspicion between them. When Diocletian comes to Rome for the first time, he's been emperor for 20 years, but he's never been to Rome. You know, he's appalled by what he sees, the kind of decadent society. Anyway, I don't need to belabor the, the comparison. It, it, it probably feels true to, to, to many people. Um, so th the concern is, well, how do you bridge something like that? And the idea that's been put, put forth by lots of people, you know, like you know, for years and years by Charlie Moscos, is some sort of national service. So is that, a, is that a pipe dream, do you think? Or is that the kind of effort we ought to be putting... Our oh, I, I agree with which you. Is, that's the way it seems yeah, I, to me. I think we should do something. We have to do something like that to, to, to forge some sense of, uh, of patriotism in the old-fashioned sense, not nationalism, but patriotism as love of country and devotion to its institutions, in, in an honest way. And uh, just this coming weekend, my brother-in-law is going to take off for Kuwait. He's, his uh, National Guard troops uh, battalion is going to be deployed to Iraq. He's a firefighter. He's a working class guy. It's guys like him who are going to fight this war. Um, so many people I know don't have any connection to this war at all. And I'm not saying that we need a draft to get everybody over there to fight a war, which I think should never have been launched, and we ought to get out of as soon as we can. Having said that, there, there is a, a disconnect between, uh, between the military caste that's, that's fighting the country's wars and the rest of us who are sending them off to fight these wars. And I, I think it's very dangerous. And Andrew uh, Basevich has written, the, the, the military historian, has written about the danger of the military being disconnected from the civilians they are supposed to serve, and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. We had a little technical problem here with my computer. But uh, as I was talking about a Andrew Basevich, um, the military historian who has warned about the, the danger of, of the disconnect between the military and the people it serves. And uh, I, I don't want to live in a militarized society. I, I hope that I've learned my lesson, as a lot of Americans hopefully have, about the, uh, the folly of Iraq, uh, a war I was in favor of, and uh, I hope I've learned my lesson. Nevertheless, we do need some something to give a greater sense of, of we Americans as a country and as a, a, a coherent civilization. And I think this is certainly true when, when you have so many immigrants coming into the country, um, and we need to find some way to assimilate them, to make them feel like they're part of the country, and make those of us who are already here realize that these are our new citizens too. So I would be all in favor of national service, though I'm sure a lot of people will whine and complain about it, saying that, well, you're putting me two years behind on my, on my money-making potential. And I, I think, sorry, we, we, have to, we have to accept that national service is a necessary institution for, uh, for the, good of the, the greater good of the country. You know, speaking of assimilation, um, for a long time that was a kind of dirty word, and it never has been to me. Uh, and you can look at the, the current state of affairs, I guess, in a couple of ways. If you, if you look at elite opinion, uh, you, you get the notion that um, uh, you know, multiculturalism is the greatest good and so on, and that we might as well just throw up our hands that assimilation is a um, forlorn goal. Um, but I'm not so sure that that's really true among, among the other 280 million Americans, uh, that assimilation and something that might be called American is still, is still the dream. Uh, I just wonder what your what your view is about that. You know, for, for all the hand-wringing that you hear on the opinion pages or the letters to the editor, um, it, when, when you get down to uh, brass tacks, uh, are we still an assimilationist society? Are we still this kind of great whirling vortex that, um, that sweeps up everything in its path? 
The way, the way Roman culture really was, it was, it was kind of an irresistible force. Uh, people wanted it so much that without ever having to make the, you know, the volitional statement, I want to be Roman, they over time became Roman. And of course many people did make that statement uh, and avidly, you know, avidly sought citizenship. Uh, you know, I think primarily we are still that kind of place and that we function that way without even thinking about it and in fact have lost faith in our abilities um, for no reason. Um, but I suspect you probably disagree. Well, I think it's a great point. I, 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 have, com I have complex feelings about it, to be perfectly honest. I, I uh, was talking to someone a couple of years ago about it, someone who's an expert on immigration, about the difference between the current wave of immigration and the, the past waves, the great wave of immigration of the Italians and the Irish. And uh, this person said to me, the thing you have to understand is the Catholic Church was the great institution for assimilation. It, it stood up for the rights of these new immigrants uh, against the broader society, but it also showed them this is how we do things in America now. You are in America. You've got to adapt. That's gone. Uh, here in, in North Texas, uh, a few years back, I wrote a column uh, about uh, tension between new Hispanic immigrants and longtime Anglo residents in a, one of our suburbs. And I called on uh, religious leaders, uh, Catholic and Protestant, to get together and try to solve this through the efforts of civil society. Do you know, Colin, not a, I, got, I heard from exactly one clergyman, and he told me, he says, I've been trying to do this in this town for years. Nobody wants to talk to each other. The Spanish want to stay on their side. The English want to stay on their side. And nobody wants to talk about it. So, uh, and there, I don't see any real, any authority in the broader culture to force people to do that. In fact, quite the opposite. We tend to like ghettoization. On the other hand, there is this very powerful commercial culture that, uh, that, that seems to erase particularity and to drive people into sort of a, a homogenous consumerism. And uh, that is, I, I think, a, a great engine of assimilation. But at the same time, it is, uh, it is something that I, I, I don't like because I like particularity. I like things to be uh, people to hold on to what's to what is theirs. And I, I don't want us all to live in little houses made of ticky-tacky. And uh, so I, I'm conflicted on it myself. I, but I, I do see here at a newspaper, um, we we all tend to be, I'm generalizing here about the newspaper, we, we tend to miss the, the people who do believe in assimilation. We get letters all the time from uh, people uh, Hispan with Hispanic surnames who say, my ancestors came here the right way, and I, I, I'm firmly against this ghettoization. And uh, I want to hear more from people like that and hear why they came to the conclusions that they did and what kind of price they may be having to pay in their own community for sticking to those traditional American beliefs. It sounds like in some, in some ways, though, we're, we're in the right place from your point of view in that um, you're – on the one hand, fearful of ghettoization, and the other hand, fearful of homogenization. Um, well, you know, welcome to America, land of no uh, Exactly, and, I, and I, I, I freely confess the contradiction there. Yeah, but, uh, uh, I, I wish that we were able, you know, in modern America, we can, we can look at what's happening in society with great particularity, uh, even though it's hard to draw you know, uh, great conclusions sometimes about what's going on. Um, much less how it's going to look from the perspective of centuries. We, we have sociologists, we have journalists, we can, we can go into communities and try to understand what's happening you know, in this block or this city and, and so on. And we don't have anything like that for the ancient world, by and large. You know, from time to time, you'll get, a, you'll get some, a, a trove of inscriptions or you know, the occasional document and so on that allows you to see things um, up close in a way that usually you can't. But by and large, we don't have access to the, to, we can't visualize the processes going on in the ancient world that we know must have been going on. And when it comes to immigration in particular, uh, I think it's a real loss because you know, I suspect that the dynamics of outsiders coming in among insiders are fundamentally similar over over time. You know, the reactions of individual people to 
other individuals as they come into your into your economy, into your family, and and so on. And there, you know, there are tantalizing clues that you get. You look at statuary. You know, from the same place, you'll see a statue of an emperor with his feet on the heads of of barbarians, and you know, a raised sword, as if to say, you know, I'm the slayer of barbarians. And then you'll see a statue of an emperor welcoming a group of barbarians into the land because, well, they were needed for this reason or that reason, for the economy or for the military. Um, and so I mean, you know that the kinds of contradictions that are so familiar to us are present in the Roman world as well, but you can't, you know, the, you, we just don't have the material to make them flesh and blood the way we can now. And uh, I, I sometimes, as I was working on this book, just found myself yearning for, um, you know, to be able to see living people in living communities. Uh, of course, nothing to be done about it, really. You know, I, I see we're getting toward the end of our time now. I wanted to ask you one important question about after Rome. You know, one comment that's uh, a quote that's, that's haunted me, and it's uh, probably going to be the basis of the next book I work on, comes from the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, who uh, wrote a book after Virtue that talks about how uh, community, in his view, and it was it's the Aristotelian view, community is something that can only be uh, is held together by virtue and by morality, a shared moral sense, and uh, that, in, in McIntyre's view, we've shattered that because we have now located uh, the, the, the moral authority in each individual. And so we have our, our discussion of morality is fundamentally incoherent, says McIntyre, in the contemporary world because there is no uh, overarching authority that we can all appeal to and recognize. And in fact, we, we do celebrate, our, we call it celebrating diversity. Um, but McIntyre says this makes us weaker as a civil society and as a civilization. And he's quite a pessimist about it. I want to read this quote from his book, After Virtue. This is a pretty well known. And he, this is how he ended the book, talking about late Rome. He said, A crucial turning point in that earlier history occurred when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with the maintenance of that Imperium. What they set themselves to achieve instead was the construction of new forms of community within which the moral life could be sustained so that both morality and, uh, and civility might survive the coming ages of barbarism and darkness. If my account of our civility, of our moral condition is correct, said McIntyre, we ought also to conclude that for some time now we too have reached that turning point. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers. They have already been governing us for quite some time. And it is our lack of consciousness of this that constitute part, constitutes part of our predicament. We are waiting not for a Godot, but for another, doubtless quite different, St. Benedict. What he's talking about is the Benedictine monks who, who, who left St. Benedict of Nursia, left the, the, the collapse of Rome, and went out and founded monasteries. And those Benedictine monasteries were the institutions that, that maintained civilization, such as it was throughout the Dark Ages until it could be refounded with Charlemagne and in, in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, his question is, and this is my question, at what point do we contemporaries decide, Cullen, that, you know what, this is not working anymore, we've got to do something else, that this, this civilization we're in is passing, and we've got to form institutions to, to help our communities survive the chaos that is to come. Do you have any sort of insight into that? Well, I just hope we're able to keep around the IT guy. Uh, you know the the it's it's a tough act following Alistair McIntyre, um, so I'll just I'll keep this brief, and probably slide out from under his question by saying I'm not sure that we actually need to turn down that road yet. Um, maybe this is why I'm um, a you know a moderate declinist rather than a you know gloomy Jane Jacobs uh, or Chalmers Roberts declinist. Uh, the, the the United States has has deep resources, both both uh, both politically and economically, but but above all, just in, in terms of the mentality of, of of ordinary Americans, it is not near to being lost. 
And, uh, and one of the great differences between modern America and ancient Rome is it's just that notion of constant self-improvement and questing on the part of, of individuals in America. The, there isn't um, a parallel to that really in ancient Rome, Rome where you had a, a very self-satisfied and complacent elite who thought that things had gotten about as good as they ever were going to get and um, let's just try to keep it this way for, for, the, the, uh, for the few. That, that is not really an attitude that you, that you find in America. And, um, and so I put a lot of faith in, in this, what you might think of as America's standard operating procedure. So I'm not, I'm not ready yet to, uh, to embrace the rule of, of St. Benedict, but I'm glad we've got it on paper, um, and um, you know, we can take it off the shelf if we need it. Well, the, the thing I'm interested in is I'm not myself ready to become a Benedictine, but I'm, I'm this close. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we, what I want to do with, with my work is go forward and find out where there are communities in this country of lay people, not monastic communities, who are living in some sort of community, and but who aren't walling themselves off like a, you know, Mormon fundamentalists behind behind these compounds, but who are managing to live lives, uh, productive lives, uh, lives that are open to others, but yet still within a community, and are managing, managing to hold on to their traditions. I'm thinking of people like um, these Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians I met up in, uh, in Eagle River, Alaska, earlier this year, who are living around their church, and uh, they're not closed off to the world, but they have a school, a church school there, and they have their church, and they, they help each other out, and they just want to live in community because the values they hold, they, they, they feel like they have to celebrate them in common. Uh, I also want to go look at uh, some of the Jewish Orthodox communities I've heard about, not the ultra-Orthodox Hasidim, but modern Orthodox, like in Mercer Island, Washington, who are doing the same thing. I hear that in, uh, in Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma, there is a Benedictine monastery going up, uh, a traditional Benedictine monastery, the mother houses in Fontainebleau, France, it's being built right now at Clear Creek, Oklahoma, and I understand that there are uh, Catholic families from all over the country who are buying up rural acreage there because they want to live in, around the monastery and community. I think these are fascinating experiments, and as you know, American history is littered with failed utopian community experiments. I don't want to live in a utopian community. I'm a conservative. I don't believe in utopia. Nevertheless, I want to see what these folks are doing and see if they do provide any sort of guidance for the future if things do fall apart and the center does not hold uh, ways that we might be able to hold on to the best of what is, the best values of our civilization and continue them until such time as we can reestablish it. But you do give me hope, Colin. I appreciate talking <laughs> well, to I, you. Well, I, I hope you live in enough of a utopia that they'll give you time off to do that book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that, that's asking for too much, my friend. Well, listen, it's been a great pleasure talking with you today, and I understand you're going to be at the Texas Book Festival in Austin uh, later this fall. Um, I hope to see you there, and I hope that some of our viewers will come out and see you there because you've written a terrific book, and you're definitely asking the right questions and the questions that more Americans ought to be asking. Thanks a lot, uh, Rod. It's been, uh, been great to be with you.